welcome. I hope uh, uh, as you gather there in your care group or you're at home uh, that you're taking advantage of the notes. You'll find those available on the website, ebczenia.org, uh, or you can grab those. Uh, most of you will get those from the email that comes from Barb's office as she sends those out. But I want to encourage you to have a, a pencil, have uh, paper with you, or if some of you take notes online, I know you take them on your computer. Uh, have your Bible out there with you as we work through the scriptures and, and deal with this topic, which uh, characteristically is called within the study of theology, ecclesiology. It comes from the combination of two Greek words, ekklesia, uh, which means church, and logos, which means a discourse or the teaching uh, about the church. So I hope you're, uh, you're, you're ready and you're prepared. Uh, also, this will help you uh, to engage uh, in the discussion that will follow in your group. Also, to help you to retain uh, what you learn. Now, as we, we start this topic, many of you know that we're in a series that we're called, called Following the Map, and we've basically been here uh, most of the year, uh, and we've interrupted it from time to time to step back and address the crisis and living in crisis. We've stepped back uh, to deal with the kind of racial upheaval that's happened in the United States and it impacts us all. Uh, but all along, we've been moving forward, talking about the key doctrines of the church or the teaching from the scriptures that, that gives us a sense of who God is, who we are, of what our mission is, what we should be up to. So it creates a map, a map of how we should think about God, think about ourselves, think about our neighbors, think about our life, life in the world. And so it's about following the map. And it's rooted in what the scriptures teach. And all doctrine is is an attempt to synthesize, to put together what the, te what the scriptures teach, and to focus on the main items that the scriptures lay out for us that are absolutely essential for how we should think and act and live and be in the world uh, until the return of Christ. So we're going to begin uh, another section here. We just finished looking at uh, the nature of the scriptures. We looked at all kinds of issues there, and many of you know we were for a number of Sundays covering issues like inspiration, inerrancy, um, the canon of scripture, translations of scripture, uh, the, the, the role of the scriptures in our daily lives as believers. So many, many things we talked about here. Now we're beginning a subsection where we're going to deal with the nature of the church. Uh, and we're going to give basically the whole month of August and the month of September to dealing with the church, uh, its nature, uh, its purposes, its mission, uh, how it organizes itself and governs itself and operates uh, all those things are going to be a part, and we're going to get into as well, why we find ourselves in the branch of the church that we find ourselves in here at Emmanuel Baptist Church, uh, as we call it. Uh, and we'll get there as we come through the series, because what we want to try to argue or try to present is we think uh, that the reason why, or the reason why we are here, we think, is because it aligns with the way the scriptures describe the church and how it should function. So we'll get there in due time. Now today, what I want you to think of this is, is I'm going to set the table. And by setting the table, uh, it's not so much that we're going to get the full meal by any means. Uh, we're going to set the table and see that uh, there's lots of things that are going to happen in the two months ahead. Uh, but also, we're going to have some instruments and some things laying there that we won't actually get to use until much later in the meal. Uh, so one of the things that I learned when I went to Scotland, and many of you know I studied over there for a while, I was introduced to the dessert spoon, uh, or the, as they would call dessert, a pudding. Uh, whatever you ate for dessert was a pudding. Not It didn't uh, have to be uh, what we think of as a pudding. It could be a cake, it could be uh, 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 ice cream, it could be anything. But the standard implement that you used uh, was the spoon, and it was what we would call our tablespoon. Not a small teaspoon, but a tablespoon. And that was your pudding spoon. Uh, and if you were to eat in Scotland, often they would put the pudding spoon right at the top of your plate when they would set it and have your forks and knives and things at the side and so forth and so on. Well, I want to set the table here for a meal uh, dealing with God's teaching on what it means to be the church. What is the church? What is its purposes? Uh, what is it supposed to be doing in the world? How is it supposed to be operating within itself uh, and so we want to talk about all of those things as we come there. And the very first thing that we need to talk about is we need to talk about the topic of what is the church. 
And here we want to get at a number of things, and uh, it's important, right, to know what the church is, to know if it's necessary. Is the church really an invention of God, if you will? Uh, is it something that he made absolutely essential? Uh, you need to know what a church is to know what to be in one, right? Is it necessary? And then am I in one? There's a lot of questions about what actually is a church. Is a group of people who just gather um, uh, as a group of friends in somebody's home, is that a church? Uh, is a group of athletes who meet together on a campus, is that a church? Uh, is Cedarville College University, is that a church? Uh, is uh, a mission organization, is that a church? Well, what is one, and, and what, what would it mean to be a part of one? And then also, we need to know what the church is to evaluate how we're doing church. Well, what is the church, and what should it be? And also, we need one to direct ourselves, right? We need to understand what the church is in order to direct the church that we're a part of. Um, because what we want to, t- the reason we're teaching from the scriptures is because we believe God is the one who ordained the church. It's his institution that should be run according to his expectations. And so we want to ask that question just what the church is. Okay? Now, when you come to this, let me throw this out here. This is a well known a solid follower of Christ who has contributed to many of us in terms of our doctrinal understanding. This is Wayne Grudem's definition from his uh, systematic theology. Uh, You can see it's quite a hefty volume because this comes from page 853. But he offers this simple definition for what the church is. And I just want to ask is, does this definition work? Uh, And I think I'm preparing you for the fact that this is one of those rare places where I'm going to disagree with Wayne Grudem about the definition of what the church is. So he simply says, the church is the community of all true believers of all time. So what he means by that, from uh, Adam and Eve all the way through, those people are a part of the church. And what I want to ask the question is, is really that the definition of the church, is the church really all believers, would we better describe those as the people of God of all generations, right? Right? Uh, from the beginning of time up until the end of time, right? Some of them are dead and in heaven, and many of them are alive, uh, and many of them have yet to be born. We can call them the people of God, those who are rightly related to him by faith, but is it accurate to call them all the church? Okay, the church, and that's our question. And we want to look at that. There's going to be ramifications for that uh, in terms of how we understand what the church is, about how the purpose of the church is formed, about how we operate the church, about what the ordinances of the church uh, do and don't do. So all those things, I'm going to set the table for some things that we're not going to develop. We're not going to get to use the instruments and eat those parts of the meal until something later on. So here's what we're trying to get after. So what I want to begin with, before we define the church, is I want to look at the big story of the scriptures. And many times people have just laid it out in this simple idea. If you think about a story with a beginning, middle, and an end, uh, the Bible begins, obviously, with a creator who is uncreated. It begins with a God who's always existed uh, and who, out of his own wisdom and delight, gave existence to the world, not out of a lack in himself, but out of his sufficiency and a desire, as many would say, to bring his glory uh, out to the blessing of his creation. The creator created everything from nothing. So everything that exists came into existence. And then, of course, By the time we get to the storyline, as the scripture gives it in Genesis chapter 3, we have the fall of Adam and Eve where they abrogate the privileges that they have and the responsibility they have to God. They turn from him, try to be their own gods as if they could be equal with him. And they fall and they bring upon themselves the curse of God that comes from their sin. And they're exiled from the garden, both as judgment and mercy. And then God institutes a whole a process of redemption whereby he wants to reclaim not only Adam and Eve and their heirs and their progeny, but he wants to reclaim the whole world that's been impacted by their sin. And so the very first thing about the, 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 the story of the Bible is that God's redemption purposes, as you can see, the fall and then redemption as he heads toward restoration, is that God is busy reclaiming everything. And sometimes when we think about salvation... Uh, especially uh, in our own tradition, sometimes we only think about just my individual relationship with God. Sometimes we expand it to, well, I know he saves me, but also he uh, reconstitutes a holy people, a church, 
right? So salvation involves me, it involves my brothers and sisters in the church, but often we don't think about that salvation, God's ultimate plan of redemption, actually embraces the whole of creation. And so what has happened because of sin in the fall that was instituted by Adam, what happened through Adam, God wants to reclaim through Jesus, we're going to find, who is the new Adam. So he's after a full record. So when we come to the restoration, which is the end of the story, which is prophetically told about in Isaiah and Jeremiah beforehand, but is told about in much more elaborate form in the book of Revelation, when we look at the restoration, it's not just that people are righted with God as individuals. It's not just that we're righted with God as a group of people in the church, but you find this scene in Revelation 4 and 5 where all nations and tongues and languages are gathered giving praise to the Lamb that was slain. And at the end of the book, it involves a new heavens and a new earth where everything is restored. And so God's purposes all along are involved in a full reclamation of that which has been degraded right, and harmed by human sin the humans in it, and the environment in which he created them and which he created them for. So that's the big story. Now, as we move on here, what we find, and there's a lot of different ways that you could break down the eras of God's dealing with people, of his eras of redemption, if you will. The term dispensation has been used, but these represent different periods, different eras uh, where God has established a particular order in which he deals with human beings and requires them to respond to him in return according to the arrangements of those eras. And so people have described them. And we could, if we had more time, which we don't today, we will later on, we talk about eschatology. But God has, uh, in these periods of time, basically from the patriarchs, beginning with Adam, all the way to the Mosaic period, the, the covenant established with Mos Moses in Sinai, there's a period of history in which God promises in particular that there's going to be a blessing that's going to come through the patriarch Abraham and the nation that he spawns that will bless all the nations. And then we come to the Mosaic Covenant and God gives his law through Moses and institutes uh, the ordering that culminates in a kingdom. And we find out more about this redemptive plan uh, that we find out the, the nature of the righteousness that will be a part of ultimately God's redemption that's there. But we also find out about the fact that they'll be instituted through some ruler. We find out it's going to be a Davidic king who's going to bring it about in this Mosaic era. And so under this particular era, under God's arrangement, the relationship between him and his people was governed by the Mosaic law. And it was governed by priests and temple practices and sacrifices, right? under a monarchy as it developed over time. But as we read the Mosaic Covenant, it looks forward beyond itself, even as David's covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7, look beyond and to him to an heir who is going to rule all things. So you have a patriarchal period, you have a Mosaic era, and then here in this moment where we live, in between the Messiah's first coming, his ascension into heaven, and his return is this period of time where he established the people which he calls the church. And so as we look at the biblical storyline and God's unfolding redemption plan, we find out that the people of God in this moment are the people called the church. And so it's a group of people that are time delimited and also that are structured by a particular arrangement of how God orders their relationship with him and with each other. But that arrangement is a development of a redemptive program that will culminate in the, pre, in, the, in the succeeding era, the Zionic, referring to Jerusalem, where Christ will reign in the millennium and ultimately will go into the eternal uh, heavens, new heavens and new earth. So to look at the big picture, it locates us as the people of God, right, in the biblical storyline, right here in this era, in this time in between the ages of the time of Christ coming, and Christ returning. And in that particular moment, that particular era, there are, there are principles and guidance for what it means to be God's people in this time that applies to us that don't apply to people under the Mosaic era and vice versa. And so God works out, if you see on your screen, God works out his saving purposes in successive eras. The eras are distinguished from each other by the different ways he manages his relationship with humanity. 
Each era builds on the former as they all progress toward the ultimate fulfillment of his purposes. And what we're going to find here is in this era is that God inaugurates, he begins uh, the blessings of the new covenant, as we're going to talk about, but they're not fulfilled in this. That happens in the Zionic era, era yet to come. All right, now if I haven't lost you yet, stay with me. And so let's define here the church. Now, as we come to the church, I want to put over here, and you'll see on the right hand of the screen, the church is redeemed humanity as it exists in the era beginning with Christ's ascension and ending with his turn, return. Okay? So unlike our initial description by uh, Wayne Grudem, uh, it's not God's people of all time. We could use the phrase of God's people as those rightly related to him by faith. But scripturally, I want to argue that the church applies to the people that are, are the followers of Jesus in between his first coming and his second coming. Uh, it had its birth in Acts chapter 2, uh, and it takes its shape in accordance with the blessings and privileges that are bestowed upon the people of God as Christ initiates the new covenant blessings in this particular era. Now, let's uh, dig into a couple things to try to define some of the characteristics and qualities and signs of this group of people. Well, one, what do you want to notice here at the top? This entity, the church, is made up of Jews and Gentiles who equally experience the inauguration of the new covenant blessings promised in the Old Testament associated with the Messiah's end-time kingdom. Okay, and that's a, there's a lot in there, right? So the Jews and Gentiles, and I say Jews and Gentiles, that's the biblical way of describing uh, humanity because the Jews have a unique role throughout God's saving work. So Jews and Gentiles who equally experience the blessings that are come from the inauguration of the new covenant that are promised in the Old Testament, and they're also associated with the Messiah, this Davidic king who's going to be the anointed ruler, they're associated with his arrival and his establishment of this end-time kingdom. Now, I want you to take your Bibles with me, and I want you to read the New Covenant. The New Covenant was prophesied, and we want to first begin in Jeremiah chapter 31. So come back to Jeremiah chapter 31, and read with me here. When Jeremiah is giving hope, right, Jeremiah is the prophet to Judah uh, as uh, they were heading toward exile underneath the Babylonians. But he gives words of hope and promise that God is faithful to the calling to Israel, not only to bring them to himself, but ultimately to reveal his glory through them as a national people, socially, politically, ultimately, so that uh, this will only come true in the millennium, in the rule of Christ on the earth, right, as the Davidic king. But here he's promising these new covenant blessings and what we find when we come to the New Testament is that these blessings are inaugurated, they come in part in the present, but they're ultimately fulfilled in the age yet to come uh, when Christ writes all things. But notice here in verse 31, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, there's where we get the title from, with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by hand to lead them out of Egypt. That's the, the Sinaitic covenant, Mosaic period. Because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time. Right? So in this new era, after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor to say one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. Okay? Now hold that one. Now also turn over with me to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. Some of you will be, be uh, fumbling around right, to find these. These are not common places that we that we turn to on a regular basis. And uh, here, this is that famous vision uh, that many will know about uh, uh, Ezekiel and the Valley of Dry Bones, a promise of a future 
resurrection of the people of God, of Israel, right, to life. But I want you to come down to verse 11. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the bones of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. No people, my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord And when I open the graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I am the Lord have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. Now what I want you to notice about these new covenant promises, and you'll see this here on the the, uh, PowerPoint, is that it involved, this new covenant involved a time of forgiveness when God would come, Jeremiah 31, and forgive their wickedness and cleanse them. And he was going to inscribe the law on their heart. And so now, instead of it being something external to them, by the work of the Spirit, as Ezekiel says, he's going to be the agent to inscribe the law on their hearts. So New Testament terms would be they would be regenerated. They'd be made new creatures. They would have new possibilities and new potential. They used to be slaves to sin. Now they're no longer enslaved. They have the ability in Christ to obey Christ from the heart. And so the law is inscribed on their hearts, and they're giving everlasting life. So here in Ezekiel 37, they're going to be raised from the dead. They're going to have resurrection life. And so the promises of the new covenant were forgiveness and cleansing, the law inscribed on their heart by the Holy Spirit, and everlasting life. Right? Now these are the characteristics of those who come to believe in Jesus Christ. Okay? I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 1 with me for a moment. Ephesians chapter 1, and I want you to look here at uh, this psalm of praise what, that, that um, Paul writes as he celebrates what God has done in Christ. And uh, I want to come really here. <clears throat> we'll just read the whole psalm of praise. It's worth reading. We'll read verse 3 on down to verse 14. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. Right? So here in the new covenant blessings, we're now brought underneath, right? where God has adopted us into his family And we share in the inheritance that truly comes through God's people, the Jews. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us and the one he loves. One of the characteristic uh, descriptions of the Davidic king was a son of God, and he was the beloved one, the sure mercies of David. So Jesus, as this Davidic Messiah, is the one who brings the blessings of the new covenant to bear on God's people. And so... Uh, He continues, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, a new covenant blessing. Our relationship with God has been cleared. Uh, Christ died and took our sin on him. The curse of the law that rested on us has now been put on him. And so we have his righteousness in its place. So redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding and made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Now, I believe in verse 10, what Paul is looking at is the ultimate, that restoration, the ultimate end, where when Christ has finished his work, even in this age through the church, the next age will see everything being righted with God, righted with each other, and, and ultimately put together in such a way that all things come up under God to the praise of his glory. Now notice here then he breaks down Jews and Gentiles in verses 11 through 14. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ, this is where I think he makes it clear that he's speaking of Jews, might be to the praise of his glory. And you, Gentiles, also were included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth the truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. 
So the new covenant blessing of the Spirit has come upon Jews and Gentiles equally, and now we've been swept into this new entity, which is called the church. So it's made up of Jews and Gentiles who equally experience the inauguration of the new covenant blessings. Now, the inauguration is made clear here in verse 14, and we'll end here, who is a deposit, the Holy Spirit that we receive now, is a down payment guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. So even now, in this era of God's dealing with humanity, in this ecclesial church era, right, God's new covenant blessings have been inaugurated, but they will not be completely experienced until the Zionic or future era that's yet to come. So the Holy Spirit, we don't get all the impact of the Holy Spirit on us at this moment. We get Him as a down payment guaranteeing our full sanctification, our full holiness, our full glorification, our full fullness in Christ that's yet to come. So it's a down payment. It both is something new that marks this moment and it's something that's a part of what is yet to come. Right, number two, let's say this. This group of people, they enter into blessings when they believe on Christ and are united with Christ and one another by the Spirit. So the, the church are people who believe on Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Now come to chapter, Galatians chapter 3, read this with me here. Verse 26, down to the end of the chapter. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Right? Now Paul, I think here by baptized means to mean put into. All of you by faith were united with Christ. You were put in a relationship with him so that what he did on the cross can become yours and what he gained in the resurrection can become yours. You were united with his death and his resurrection. And so you clothe yourselves with Christ. You're in Christ. You're in union with him. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So the patriarchal promise that came through Abraham has now actually worked its way out through Jesus the Messiah and now has extended to Jew and Gentile as they believe on Jesus the Messiah. So they enter into the blessings when they believe in Christ and are united with Christ and one another by the Spirit. Now I think it's important here to notice here in verse 28, he's not saying that once you come to Christ, there's not men or women anymore, and there's not Jews and Gentiles anymore, and there's not different classes of people anymore. What he's saying is now, if you believe on Christ, every one of those groups have equal access to and the complete blessings that come to them that are equivalent to what anyone else gets. There's no hierarchy in the body of Christ in terms of God's blessing and provision. But God doesn't stop men from being men or women from being women. He doesn't make uneducated people completely educated or vice versa, right? And here, he doesn't even call for the complete obliteration or assimilation of people of different cultures. Uh, and we're going to talk about this later is that in this new people, they have an equality of access to God and equality of blessing when it comes to God, but they bring their different cultures and ethnicities, their different genders, into this people of God as a part of a complementary uh, relationship with one another that enriches and expands the notion of what it means to be the people of God. So we'll come back to that. Then number three, they express this change by holiness toward God and love toward one another but it's a love that embraces their equality before God as well as all of their human, ethnic, cultural, and natural differences that do not stand contrary to their identity as followers of Christ. So what we're going to find, and this is where the big story comes into play, is that it's not God's design, ultimately, in the restoration of humanity to obliterate all gender and all ethnic and all national distinctions, but he gives a picture of heaven with all nations of different people standing before giving uh, uh, worship to uh, the Lamb, and they bring all the beauty and diversity of, of the, the wisdom and blessing of God that was intended uh, to come through humanity. They bring that now in harmony with each other, reconciled and at peace with one another, and complementing one another to the glory of God. So there's this great symphony, uh, symphony of humanity giving glory to God in all of its multifaceted forms. And so they express this. And then the outward signs of participation by faith 
in Christ in the new covenant blessings is baptism, right? So many of you know this. This is what Jesus said. And baptism here is this outward sign. It's this symbol that depicts their belief in the Messiah. It's not something that makes them a new covenant person. But Jesus takes it as the sign that should mark all of those who have believed on him as Messiah. So he says to his own followers, Matthew 28, Therefore, verse 19, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you, and surely I am with you always. Okay? Now come to 1 Corinthians 11. We were there just last week. We we're dealing with communion. 1 Corinthians 11. Here, I'm going to talk about how Paul talks about the institution of the Lord's Supper, how it was practiced in the early church. And you remember these words uh, in verse 24. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it. Right? So it represents their belief in the Messiah. Right? This is a, a token of Jesus' vows to them and what he's done for them, and they, by taking it, are saying, yes, we have received Jesus as our Lord, and yes, we have taken on the blessings and the responsibilities of our new covenant relationship to him, to serve him, to represent him in the world until he comes. So Paul ends and says, we do this in remembrance of him until he comes as people forgiven, as people empowered by the Spirit, as people who have a, the, the ability to be transformed from the inside out, uh, we do this as the new covenant people and celebrate those new covenant blessings every time we take the communion. All right. Now, so if we want to look for a moment, and you've seen this chart before, I've used this in other settings, right? So this, this, this ecclesial era, this moment of this time in between the times, uh, is this moment in which we live. And it's the people of God in this era that are called the church. Right? The people who exist in this time in between the ascension of Christ and the return of Christ is the church. And so in this particular period of time, the way God orders this, the major issue is now in this moment, through belief in Jesus, people of all nations, all genders, all classes come together as one people in Christ, equal in him, with equal access to God, equal resources and gifts in him, right? And it doesn't mean that we blend those in such that we deny our distinctions or we move toward androgyny and gender. That has nothing to do with that. But now, instead of hostility, there's peace. Instead of, of uh, uh, disharmony, there's harmony and oneness, Right? And so we submit, uh, and anything that doesn't threaten or uh, doesn't detract from the lordship of Jesus Christ and the cultures that we bear, we bring those together to the glory of God. But we live in a moment, as we talked about before, that's an already not yet moment. The new covenant blessings have been inaugurated, but they have not been consummated. And so even though we are people who have the spirit, we've been forgiven and cleansed, right? And we've been brought together as one people under God, we still live in a moment where it's overlapped by the evil, present evil age, so that we're people who have the ability to follow Christ, but we're also vulnerable, and we need to understand that. So this is why, as I've shared with you before, is the church, we are people who live in between the times. We live in between the time of the time when we are come alive in Christ, right? When we believe on Him, we're made alive in Him, till the time that Christ returns and that uh, the life that we have been given in an inaugural form, an initial form, is consummated. It's brought to its fullest expression. Right? And so the time of life, type of life that we live here has all kinds of implication, and I mentioned these. We're content people. We have found the path of blessing, an ultimate blessing, but we won't know that until we see Christ. So we're constantly pressing into grasping more and more of what it means to know Christ and follow him and serve him. We're confident in our ability to serve Christ because we have the Spirit. We know our relationship with God. We know our identity in Him. But we're cautious because we know we can sin. We know that we're not free from sin's influence because we've not been fully sanctified or fully glorified. We're not fully conformed. We positionally are in a right relationship with God. We know that we're sons and daughters of Christ. We have the Holy Spirit within us. But we're not fully conformed to Him morally. And we can sin. We're competent We've got gifts and abilities and resources, 
but we're humble because there's, we know there's so much that we need to learn and we know that we're all on the way. So this is the life of the people of God in the moment. We're going to come back to that in times ahead. Now, one other distinction we want to make, and this is key here, we talked about what the church is, but I've used the term the church, and many of you think, well, wait a minute, are we talking about our church or the church? Are we talking about a church or the church? Well, as we look in Scripture, what we want to find out when we look at this people group, the church, this people that exists between the time of Christ's ascension, when he ascended, now we exist with the king ascended, and then when he descends, that church era will come to a close, and that group of God's people will have run their course, and then they'll move on into the final stage of God's purposes, along with all those who have rightly believed in God through all the ages. But what we find here during this period of time as we break it out is we've got the people of God of all times. That's the, the people who are rightly related to God through all times. But as we look at this particular moment, we can talk about the universal church, meaning all of those who believe in Jesus Christ in this present moment between Christ's ascension and his second coming. And then also the church will speak, it'll speak in the New Testament about churches. There's the church and churches. So the LC stands for local church. So you've got one universal church, a group of people who all belong to Jesus and have put their faith in the Messiah in this period of time in between Christ's coming and his return. And then those groups are also found only in local churches. So let's distinguish those from each other a little bit. Okay, now there's a lot of material on here. So uh, we'll run through this quickly, but this is something we're going to come back to uh, as we define what the church is. So, let's begin, and here's where we started with our definition of the church, universal, if you look at the left-hand side. All those everywhere from the time of Christ's ascension until his return, right? Everywhere. This is around the globe. This also includes all the people who have lived and died since the time of Christ up until this moment, and includes those who will live yet in ages to come if Christ tarries. So all those everywhere from the time of Christ's ascension until his return who have repented of their sins, trusting in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for salvation. Right, the church universal. But notice the church local then is a group of Christians who regularly gather in Christ's name to officially affirm and oversee one another's membership in Jesus Christ and his kingdom under qualified leaders through gospel preaching and gospel ordinance. A lot of things there. So what we're going to find here, though, as I depicted earlier in this previous slide, if I can back up one here, back up one here, this previous slide is that the local church is a subset of the universal church. Everyone that is the universal church in the New Testament is in a local church. Right? So we want to describe a little bit of the differences between them. Here. Now, just to compare and contrast, there's many, many things we could add to this list. Here's just some of them. Well, the universal church is composed of all Christians everywhere and of all times, really, in between the time. And this is when Christ says in Matthew 16, I will build my church. But the local church is composed of Christians in one location, right? The church of Corinth. The church universal is one body, right? We're talking about Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, right? This one body of Christ, Right? But there's many expressions of the body. Romans 16, 16 has all the churches of Christ greet you. So all of them compose the, are united with Christ together, but yet it's expressed in many local bodies. And then thirdly, it began on the day of Pentecost. The universal church right, began with the offer to believe on the Messiah and his completed work that happened with Peter in Acts chapter 2. But a local church begins whenever people join together uh, under qualified leadership. Right? So we're going to find that in all kinds of places. You find that in Acts chapter 11. The universal church, you enter it only by being added by the Lord. This is the idea that God brings people into his church and that mystery of how he works to bring people to himself. Right? Uh, God draws them to himself. But here, you enter a, a local church by publicly joining the church through a public identification with Jesus. Right? Here at Emmanuel, you come, give your testimony. You've given your testimony before the elders and the pastors to affirm that you are a follower of Christ. Right? And then uh, next on the universal church, the Lord keeps the membership roles, Hebrews 12, 23. 
The Lord keeps these roles of all people who believe. You see that in 2 Timothy 2.19 and Philippians 4. But when you come to the local church, it's enrolled through human judgment, affirmation by elders and congregation. Okay? Now this comes to the next point, that the universal church consists of all who believe on Christ, but when you have a local church, you can have potential for some members to be unsaved. So you can have people a part of a church who really aren't a part of the church. But I'm going to say this a little bit later. Everyone who's a part of the church, though, will be in a church. Okay. So here, and this is a famous statement in 1 John, is they went out from us, meaning they left our congregation because they were not of us. So you can have people who present themselves as followers of Christ or operate that way, but genuinely are disconnected from him, and you can find them in churches. And on the other side, again, um, heavenly organization. Christ is the cornerstone of his church. He's the head of his church. He's the shepherd of his flock. Right? Those are all biblical images. But on the earth, right, the earthly organization of the local church, you have qualified male leaders and servants, deacons, elders and deacons, are the structure that God ordains for the local church. And then the church uh, that is the universal church, all those who truly believe in Christ, it cannot be divided, divided or fail. It's one church that is sustained together by God's people, and it will not fail because Christ will build it, and the gates of hell won't prevail. But, it, but a local church can be divided and fail. The church at Corinth was divided. The church at Corinth was abysmal when they came together because it was riven by sin and brokenness. Now, on the other hand, the universal church, there's no ordinances. The universal church doesn't uh, institute communion or baptism, but the local church both gives baptism and communion as indicators of membership in the universal church. Right? So the church, universal, is all those everywhere from the time of Christ's ascension until his return who have repented of their sins, trusted in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. A local church is where everyone who's in a member of the universal church will find themselves somewhere in their location, organized under leadership, approved by that body, in order to affirm and oversee each other's discipleship and walk with Christ. Now, we've said a lot today just to set the table, but what I want to ask, you know, as we come here, right, is I want to try to teach you as we work our way through not only what the church is, but how the church what the church's mission and purpose is, what it should be doing and not being doing, which is a, a big question today that's affecting the church. And we want to talk about, well, how does the church organize itself and, and, and what do the members do and what do the leaders do and, and therefore, why do we find ourselves in the branch that we're in? All those things are a part of it. But one of the things we want to emphasize all, the, all, the, all along is, are you a part of the church? Have you believed in Jesus Christ? Because it doesn't make any difference if you have if you're a part of a local church and you've attended one over the years, if you have never recognized that Jesus Christ has died for you, that you're a rebel and that you have sinned against him and that all the struggles you have are, are, rebellion, are rooted in a rebellion from him and a separation from him, and it doesn't make any difference how many religious things you do or have done, those are not what writes you to to God. Those are things that, that, that cannot bridge the gap between you and God caused by your sin. The only thing that can do that is by you putting your arms down and saying, God, I have sinned against you, and I think I, I take by faith, I trust you, that Jesus has done for me what I cannot do for myself. Please save me. Save me. That makes you a member of the church. And then the second one, are you a member of a church? And we're going to try to make the case as we work across if that there's no such thing of a person who is rightly related to God who isn't intricately connected to a local church. Because the way the people of God in this era live out their life as the church is in little outposts of God's kingdom, organized according to his principles in fellowship with each other, affirming, guiding, disciplining, correcting one another, loving one another in a local body. So, as we work our way through, are you in the church? And are you in a church? Let's pray together as we end today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercies to us. We thank you for what you have done for us. Lord, it's, uh, 
uh, undeserved, Lord, the new covenant blessings come to us not because of we have earned them or not because, uh, Lord, we're so good or, or that we have done all the religious things that we need to or we've kept our way, self away from other things that other people have gotten into. No, Lord, they come to us when we recognize that we're broken and we can't have anything that we truly need and long for. When we turn to you, Lord, you, you forgive us of our sins. You put them out from in between you and us that shapes our relationship with you, and you cleanse us, Lord, of our sin. And Lord, you give us your spirit, you make us new, and you empower us, Lord, for a different kind of life. As Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. And Lord, you allow it so that we can be renewed and changed. And Lord, we can be someone that knows your life and can bring life to other people. Lord, today we lean in on you and we thank you for those blessings. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters as they listen. Lord, I pray for anyone who doesn't know you. I pray that today they'd come to know you today. Lord, I pray that they would stop being far off. They would stop trying to make it on their own. They would stop uh, trying to uh, be their own God and their own Savior. Lord, I pray that they would turn to you today so that you could rescue them. And Lord, I pray for us as a church. Lord, I pray as we work through this series, Lord, teach us to be your people. Lord, remind us of who we are, uh, Lord, of what you've done for us, of what you've called us to be, what our purpose is. Lord, save us from getting distracted, Lord, from our purpose and direction. Save us, Lord, from looking, Lord, to other sources to give us guidance and direction. So, Lord, teach us, we pray, as your people. And so we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. God bless you.